meet whoever you're marketing to where they are and then take their hand and don't ever, you know, try to like talk at people, talk with them. You know, it's not about teaching by preaching. It's about teaching by example. You know, walk your talk and talk your walk. Hey, producer here to give you a heads up that we had some technical difficulties in the first half of this episode. Please excuse our messy action. The content of this episode is too good not to share. And we know you'll get so much out of this entire conversation with Kayla and serial entrepreneur, Marcy Zaroff. Welcome to the show. I am so excited for all of you amazing people that are taking the time out of your busy schedules to learn and to grow. Today, I get the pleasure of having a serial entrepreneur on the podcast. And what was so cool is after I always like dig in and research whoever I'm going to have on because I want to make sure they're amazing. And plus, like I want to ask questions that nobody else has asked. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found out that she co-founded a school that a lot of you that are listening in have probably heard of, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, which I was a student at like 10 years ago, which I was so cool. She is, she's a mom of two and she is an eco lifestyle pioneer. She actually trademarked the term eco fashion before it was cool back in 1995. Okay. Marcy is the founder and CEO of eco fashion corp. She's an author. She's an internationally recognized eco lifestyle expert and has also co-founded good catch foods and beyond brands. Conscious Consulting Collective with her husband, Eric Schnell. She's been featured in all sorts of media. She's led the industry working with major retailers like Whole Foods, Target, and Nordstrom. And she's still here with multiple thriving brands because she's adapted over decades of different marketing trends. I mean, you're a true serial entrepreneur. Marcy Zeroff, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And yeah, it's a little bit of be careful what you wish for, but all good. I'm very, uh, very lucky that I found the path that I did, you know, so many years ago and have stayed true to it. Lots of pivots and twists and turns, but always that same kind of, you know, vision at, at hand, no matter what category I'm in. I love that you pivoted so many times because I think especially women, we need to hear the story over and over again, that it's okay to pivot. If what you're currently doing right now, it doesn't, you know, maybe it's not working out or you're not as passionate about it anymore, that it's okay to like move on to the next thing. So I really want to get into that today. But first I have a question. How many businesses have you founded or co-founded up to this point? IIN, uh, Under the Canopy. Good Catch, Beyond Brands, uh, Eco Fashion Corp, MetaWare, Yes And, Seed to Style, Farm to Home, I Am, uh, <laughs> never a dull moment, right? Uh, yeah, those are the main ones. Those yeah, are the big guys. Okay, over 10. That's like so amazing. Now, I know you didn't just like wake up one day and go, I'm going to, you know, found a uh, you know, over 10 companies. Like, how did you get to that point where you raised by entrepreneurs? Tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah. So um, I actually grew up in South Florida and I was the classic kid with the lemonade stand. So I think I was just wired intuitively as an entrepreneur, lived a more conscious lifestyle as I got later into my teens. So when I was 16 years old, a girlfriend gave me a book called Living in the Light by Shakti Gawain. And it struck a really deep chord in me. And as that, you know, kid who had business cards by the time I was, you know, 12 and literally I was doing professional calligraphy, I was doing, you know, anything I could do to sort of get my fingers and toes into business. So of course I, I then moved to California, (laughs) which given my affinity for, you know, consciousness and sustainability and, and being a vegetarian and being into yoga, Um, And we're talking about now in the 80s, not to age myself, but I moved to California, went to school at Berkeley. I got a business degree and 
you know, I all through college, I was cooking for people because they were always asking me, you know, like, what do you do? Your hair looks good. Your skin looks good. You look so fit. What do you do? And I realized while I was in school and, and I was, you know, cooking and having people over, it was just more of my personal hobby. I was going to environmental conferences and food conferences because I was passionate about it. And, and you know, on the business side, I was getting a finance and marketing degree. But then I realized, you know, one of the disconnects I think a lot of people have is that they have two sets of values. They have their personal values and their professional values, right? And to me back in, in those days, it was like, wait a minute, why can't I create one in the same? So when I graduated from business school, I moved to New York City. And that's where I kind of had this aha that, you know, you can go to school for technology, for art, for music, for business, for anything. Where do you go to learn about the most important thing that we have, right? Which is our health and our well being. And so I started the school out of my apartment. All of my first students were like my sister in laws and my sisters and my friends. Um, and soon, you know, uh, other people started coming. And little by little, the school just started to, you know, grow organically and, evolve where we outgrew my apartment and which my ha husband at the time was very happy about. Uh, and then we moved into kind of our own space and kept growing. Today, IIN um, has certified almost 200,000 people worldwide as health coaches. And the program, I think, is in about 160 countries around the world. It's an online program and certification, as you know. But I, I like the gratitude I get, you know, every day meeting people now that I'm back in New York City that are graduates of IIN. It just gets me so excited because the ripple effect has been, you know, exponential. So from there, I, I saw the connection between food and fiber. You know, I was in agriculture back in the early 90s and realized that, you know, you can't really support one part of the equation without the other. And so I was really learning about that sort of crop rotation, interconnection, the fundamentals of organic agriculture, and stumbled upon the fact that cotton is one of the most heavily sprayed industries in the world. It's the dirtiest crop in agriculture. And that woke me up in a way, kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Our first basic need is food. And then we evolve and say, what else? What's next? And shelter and clothing. We all you know, buy clothing, right? And protect our outside, not just the inside. So that's kind of where I coined and trademarked the term eco-fashion in 1995 and people thought I was crazy and these are two dichotomous worlds and you know and I was like well I can't be the only one that wants to be stylish and you know and have that kind of design driven you know look good but also be true to my values right and you know start to pull the curtain back and unveil the human and environmental impacts going into the fashion industry. And that's where, you know, I really started to do that sort of groundwork and build this movement that today, fast forward 30 years, you know, journey of a thousand miles, right? But the whole industry is waking up today. And as I mentioned earlier, I've started a lot of different things. I've pivoted every step of the way, but you know, I'm kind of a walking cliche. What doesn't kill you makes you smarter and stronger and better and clearer. And, you know, one door closes, another one opens. And for me, this whole process of getting to where I am today, which is what I talk about in my book, Eco Renaissance, co-creating a stylish, sexy and sustainable world. And it connects the dots of the whole lifestyle and helps people understand that, this is not about, you know, sacrifice or deprivation, you know, embracing a more conscious, sustainable lifestyle. It's about value add. It's about getting more. It's about no compromise in value or values. And so I really spent my life work, you know, at the front lines, educating, inspiring, activating, innovating, collaborating, everything that I can do to, you know, keep driving this movement forward. It's amazing what you've been able to create. I live in Newport Beach in California, and we have this really cute mall. It's called Fashion Island. And I walked past it the other day with my daughter, and there was a brand new um, eco-friendly athletic wear store there. And I go, oh, my gosh, we have to go in here. I'm so excited because she's been wanting to wear it. Like, I'm not going to name the bad brands, but there's a lot of them, you know, with a, a athletic wear. And I'm like, oh, we're going to go in here. We're going to make this cool. We're going to make everybody at your school want to wear this stuff. But I mean, you know, you, you really pioneered that. That's what almost 30 years later that now we have a store that's actually selling these types of things. That are I pinch myself. To blaze the trail, it takes so much bravery and to, you know, to stand firm in what you believe in. And, you know, I think people 
they can stand firm to a certain point and then they sometimes crumble and give in to because it's too hard. There's so much resistance that they eventually just give in to what everybody else is doing. How did you stand firm? What was your routines like back then where you're like so mind strong? Well, I'm definitely wired in the most classic, you know, entrepreneurial way, right? Like anybody can pick up a paintbrush, but not everybody can translate it onto a canvas. Being an entrepreneur, you have to have certain qualities to get through what you're talking about, right? Like persistence, tenacity, vision, passion, conviction. I mean, these are sort of fundamentals, right? So, you know, I never in my career have questioned my my vision. I've always felt very deeply driven by, you know, this kind of vision is the art of seeing things invisible. It's a Jonathan Swift quote. I've always believed wholeheartedly that it was not an if, it was a when. People would wake up to what I was building because, you know, the truth is, is on an intuitive level, you know, I don't think any human being wants to destroy and pollute and degrade and poison and, you know, and fill the air and the water and their families' lives with things that don't serve us. The problem is that we've all grown up in a world, especially since the Industrial Revolution, that has taken us so far from our roots, from our, you know, from our sort of gut instinct of what's right. I mean, remember, we're just part of nature. We're not outside of nature, right? We are part of an ecosystem. We depend on the environment because we breathe out carbon and nature breathes it in and breathes out oxygen, which we breathe in. We have a symbiotic relationship with the environment. We forget that. We've gotten so far removed that we think it's okay to consume fast food, fast fashion, and all kinds of, you know, choices that have been made over the last, you know, several decades that have ultimately created that kind of, you know, negative destruction. So, you know, you say we are what we eat. We also look at the world we're living in today. I mean, it's not about climate change. It's a climate crisis at this point. I mean, we're seeing, I, it's crazy. I mean, you're in California, the fires, the floods, these hail storms, snow in LA, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, we had a tornado in my hometown in Pennsylvania last weekend. We've never had one. You know, like things are happening in ways that are really waking people up. So, you know, go back to building this movement for me. It was like, how do we create something? And I talk about this a lot in my book. It's actually the premise of my book, which is through the lens of design, we can change the world. If you lead people through that sort of visceral, aesthetic sense, right, things that they're looking for in food, that's taste. In beauty products, it's scent and functionality. The founder of Aveda wrote my forward. He was my mentor of 25 years. And I just like watched everything that he was doing, you know, and building Aveda, you know, and in fashion, style and quality, in business, profitability, right? Like you have to lead with what people want. That's the yes. And oh, by the way, it's also you know, sustainable, environmentally responsible, ethically made, low impact, you know, fair trade, recircular, regenerative, organic, you know, these are the things that add value, but you're not taking something away. So that whole concept, and I connect the dots of all these different lifestyle choices. And I always say, you know, it's about agriculture to popular culture, right? It's about helping people understand the source of everything that we're choosing. And that's where, you know, you see the first movement here around consciousness has started in food because the farm to table movement was really about getting back to source. Where's my food coming from? What's in it? How's it being made? Who's growing it, right? And then I'm putting that in my body, right? You are what you eat. Now it's evolving, clean beauty, right? It used to be that, you know, Aveda was the only product on the shelves anywhere that was environmentally friendly. Now you go into CBS or Walgreens or Duane Reed or any or Target or Walmart or you know any of these retailers and the shelves in the beauty section are lined with clean beauty. And now we're seeing sustainable fashion. So it's an evolution of, you know, as Albert Einstein once said, right? We can't solve today's problems with the same consciousness that created them. So now we're looking at changing our consciousness, climbing that ladder to see, you know, and you asked me how did I get through all this? It's that it is about perspective, right? And if you, the higher you climb, the more you see 
And then when your view is so much wider, so much bigger, you don't get stuck in the noise, right? Because you're you're sort of above it. And so for me, like, yeah, has it been a challenge? You know, as I said earlier, you know, it's been a lot of kind of like, but pivoting is not necessarily a bad thing. People who think hitting walls in business is a negative thing. It's actually our greatest opportunity for growing and learning and getting better and smarter, right? Because it's those those perceived walls that we hit that allow for us to pivot and flow because just I'll end with saying, you know, we're made of energy. Everything we choose that we put in, on, and around ourselves is energy, right? Everything. So therefore, energy wants to flow. And when we block it, it gets stuck. It doesn't flow. So it's all about how you see who we are and every choice that we're making in the world. And that's, I've built my life work on that. So when I am moving, I'm just flowing. Oh my gosh. I love that. And as I was like um, poking my face, I have my little EMS blocker bracelet. <laughs> awesome. We're talking about that. Cause I'm like, I don't want anything. That's part of it is like, you know, there's, there's so much going on in the world that I think people are still asleep to, or they, they just don't want to see it, you know? And yeah. It's like modern day Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. Like we have to have this, these conversations to open people's mindsets up. So they are aware, you know, so many people still think I ate that when I was a kid and I turned out fine. And I'm like, are you really okay? Are you really thriving right now? You know? And usually the answer is no, like, no, I'm not thriving. You might, uh, you're just used to feeling bad. A lot of people are used to feeling bad anyway. So I love what you're doing. I was at Sephora last night, actually, trying out all these new makeups to put on my skin. And I, it's actually, I mean, I have all, all clean makeup on right now, clean mascara. I'm like, I feel like I'm glowing. I feel like it's, it's even better. Like it doesn't look cakey, you know? Like yeah. the well, I mean, you know, people forget that when we talked about, you know, you are what you eat, but your skin is the largest organ in your body, right? It's your primary organ for absorption. And so what we put on our skin absorbs in and becomes again a part of who we are and 70 million americans are walking around with asthma and allergies or skin conditions a third of the population has chemical sensitivity i mean asthma allergies eczema psoriasis i mean you name it and people oftentimes they just think oh genetic oh it's general environment or oh it's you know food, if I change my diet, and they don't stop to think about the beauty products and the textiles that we're wearing that are ridden with toxic chemicals that we're putting on our skin. So choosing, you know, choosing clean food and beauty and fashion is choosing something. It's choosing to put things in and on ourselves that make sense. Uh, I'm so glad I'm having this conversation. I'll probably link up Uh, a lot of my favorite stuff in the show notes too. Let's get into the business side of things because, you know, you can be this woman on fire. You you can clearly tell that you're like so passionate about it all these years later, right? But nobody, nobody achieves a mission alone. So how did you get to that point of like being a passionate entrepreneur and also building out a team? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because when I hire, I often say to somebody, If you could write your own job description, what would it be, right? Because another one of my favorite quotes is work is love made visible by uh, Khalil Gibran in a book called The Prophet. And I believe that when you love your work, it's not work, it's love. And we all just want to love and be loved, right? At the core of who we are, that's the fuel, that's the DNA, that's that's the fire in our bellies that makes us, that drives passion. It drives all of us, you know, everything that we do and who we are, right? So, and creation, right? Which is the that we have out there is the one that we've co-created, right? So, you know, I think when I think about hiring people, I, I want people to, you know, be a part of a bigger picture vision. It's not just a job. And the minute somebody starts seeing it as just a job, like a dread going in, I got to be there at nine and I got to leave up, you know, I don't even want them there, right? Because it's not the right energy. Negative energy holds everybody back, right? So it's about, you know, I think building culture and look, you know, it's always about better, not perfect because life is real, right? But I really am trying to build a sense of 
you know, unity in the community, right? Where we're all in this together. I've always at every one of my companies given stock options to my team. You know, what I think is so interesting is your whole concept of hiring people and bringing the right team along is one that I think everybody listening in needs to adopt, right? Because when we have people that are a part of our ecosystem that are, you know, they're dragging, they're not on their A game. It affects everybody. Like, you know, we can all show up to work and say, Hey, I'm going to be on my A game. I'm passionate about what we're doing. But if somebody comes with their C game, it affects the energy in the room. Have you ever had a situation where you had an employee that was bringing that type of energy into the space? And how did you handle it? If so? Yeah, my husband and I joke about this all the time. We're allergic to politics. In the, I mean, like certain things, it's very hard to to always contain. But there are people by nature that are very divisive. Mm -hmm. And they come into a company and they're like trying to figure out how to like get themselves higher by stepping on those along the way. Right. And as soon as we sense that, you know, and, and my husband, and I kind of, we share notes cause he's also an entrepreneur, which makes life lots of fun. Um, <laughs> you can sense when people are just negative. And honestly, to me, that's grounds for you. You don't fit in here anymore. That to me is not a healthy energy to bring into a company. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and look, I encourage people to over communicate. So if they do have a problem before, you know, look, cancer becomes a tumor when it's left, you know, unattended to. Right. Mm -hmm. So I take responsibility as a CEO. I mean, part of my job is to do my best to make sure that if people need to talk. I always say, just get time on my calendar. You know, I'll always make time for you. Just get on my calendar because you know, look, I've also learned in 30 plus years in business, I used to think I had to do everything myself. You know, it was like, you kind of, when you're starting your own business that you, you're so sensitive to that, but then you realize that your time is best spent in certain ways and you have to rely on other people and you learn to delegate and you learn to engage people. And it is a skill that you continue to improve on, you know, over time and through, you know, experience. Right. But I can never do what I do without an amazing team around me. I mean, I recognize that I'm only as good as the people around me, you know, and, and their ability to work together as well. You know, I always say one plus one equals 11 because we're exponentially stronger together than apart. Mm -hmm. And co-creation isn't just two people. It's teams of people. It's businesses coming together. It's for profits and nonprofits working together. It's my team in the US working with my team in India and my team in Bangladesh. It's we're all in this to, you know, rise together, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, finding people and building a team of people that are in it, like with that same sort of, you know, passion and vision and fire and, you know, the, their belly to change the world through business. Those are the people I want at the table, not the people who are necessarily the most skilled. I want someone who's skilled in the area that I'm hiring them for without a doubt. But if they don't share that sort of inner excitement about what we're doing and, you know, look at it the way I just expressed, mm -hmm. they're not going to fit. It. It's not going to work. That's that was the magic of Whole Foods markets, by the way, like when they started. Whole Foods, you know, was uh, like back in the 90s or 80s, it was, you know, the health food movement was, you know, was still considered very niche, very fringe, very, you know, hippy dippy, Granola. right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. I mean, you know, look, the stigmas of organic food being granola and brown rice mm -hmm. and right. But it took a lot of that sort of collective vision that was very entrepreneurial and very creative and very, I'll think out of the box and very, you know, brave to kind of always be pushing things forward. It's about, you know, it's, it is the journey of a thousand miles, you know, begins with one step, right? The Lao Tzu quote that it's about taking one step at a time, you know, and, you know, always forward, right? Like always see where you're going. And it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. You have to enjoy the ride, right? Whenever someone wants to start a business, I always say, put your seatbelt on and be prepared like you're on a roller coaster 
to go up and down and around and around. And you might even flip a few times, you know, but you've got to have fun, right? Because this is, it's like life is real and you want to enjoy, you know, the journey and you want to also be, you know, be open to learning and growing because that's part of life too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so much of what you do in your life is your work. And so why not make it fun? Exactly. On that point of, you know, when people are starting out, maybe something new, let's say somebody listening in right now wants to start a new product. How do they know if they have a good idea or not? I mean, so much of being an entrepreneur is trusting your gut, right? I mean, the number one thing to think about is, are you solving for something that doesn't exist? right? Like you might have a great idea, but if 50 other people have the exact same idea and it's already in the market and you're trying to get shelf space against something like proven brands, that's going to be a lot harder than if you identify a white space and you're solving for something that either doesn't exist or barely exists or is just starting to exist, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you want to be thinking about, okay, do your due diligence. You know, if you don't, automatically know what the white space is, find it, like find the the hook or the, you know, the thing that's going to make you different from everybody else that is doing it. And then, you know, again, set goals, start to, you know, slowly one step at a time, build, but build lean and mean. Another big mistake entrepreneurs make, they raise a bunch of money and they just blow through it because they get all excited and, you know, and they think, oh, I can go get this in a big new office and a shiny this and a, you know, a great team. And like, if you burn through the capital too fast and you haven't hit your, you know, performance goals, you're going to get diluted and you're going to lose control of your company over time. If you even have a company that can get funded again, if you've, you know, burned through it. So Mm -hmm. I'm incredibly scrappy and very mindful about every dollar that gets spent whether I'm, you know, a startup mode or I'm already an established company, you have to have that kind of mindset to get your money to go as far as it can, you know, and get as much bang for the buck as possible. Those, that, those are a couple of the things I would say. Oh my gosh. So good. I needed to hear that. So when you're in this entrepreneur space and you've made all these connections with these retailers, what do you feel like was the biggest challenge of working with the major retailers? So I would put challenge and opportunity in the same bucket here too. And that's because the biggest challenge, especially in the world that I'm in today, which is, you know, for the last 25 years, I've been, you know, driving the fashion industry, you know, into sustainability and ethical manufacturing and blah, blah. So (laughs) most companies, almost all classic brands and retailers, they operate in silos. So the sourcing, design, finance, marketing, production, they're all operating in their own business units. And mm-hmm. they don't talk to each other because they're talking with it among themselves, right? Their meetings are among themselves. They're, all of their incentives are among themselves generally. And in order to have a holistic, truly sustainable and successful program or strategy, you have to be thinking more from a holistic lens, right? Like a, mm-hmm. a, a place of we're all working together and solving for something that is about a puzzle. And you have to be looking at each piece in the puzzle. So one of the challenges I, I would have is going into a, a big brand or retailer is who am I talking to? Am I, am I talking to the sourcing team, the marketing team, the design team, the finance team, the, C, the C-suite? Or all of the above. And in the case of, you know, how to successfully break through and how I've been able to, you know, launch first time sustainable textile initiatives with some of the biggest retailers in America is starting at the top and getting that strategic buy in so that I can be sort of the core of the apple to pull the different pieces together. And I always say when I'm meeting with executives today, you know, you need to be looking at this through a lens of you need to have people who are all working together across their different, you know, areas of the business. Otherwise it won't work. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh my gosh. Okay. I feel like everybody needs to take notes, go, go to the decision makers right away. 
the confidence, were you just born with it? Cause I think, you know, like you <laughs> you had to this lemonade, you know, Stan, and you were, had this entrepreneur, you know, spirit. I think that like, I, people always ask me, Kayla, where'd you get your confidence from? And for me, I'm like a faith-based person. So I always know that there's just something guiding me, you know, and I think other people, I don't know, I don't know how they get their confidence. Like, how did you get your confidence to just be like, you know, nobody's done it before and here I am and everybody in this room should listen to me right now. I would say, you know, it's probably a combination of things. It's probably some of it is, you know, inherent and like my parents were incredibly loving and I have always sort of subscribed to, you know, gratitude as an attitude, right? Like if you wake up with a a state of appreciation, then you go through your day and your life differently in terms of how you see things. Mm -hmm. I think I've had a spiritual practice my whole life that has been also, you know, a combination of tapping into what I might call like universal consciousness or God consciousness, which is really about being our, like being our best self. And I think that, you know, when you have that sort of very deep seated trust in, you know, you can create not just the world around us that I talked about earlier, but every second of every day, you're making a choice. And so, you know, this idea that we're so disconnected from who we are is part of the problem of our society, why there's so much depression and so much anger and so much, I mean, hate and so much because nobody has stopped to really just stop, like ground yourself in the fact that you have a lot more power as a, as an energetic entity, as a person, as a, you know, as a, you know, citizen of this world to create the reality that you want by just one step at a time. And that, I think that when you get empowered, it gives you confidence, right? Mm, So mm -hmm. I've, I've kind of subscribed to that mindset and it's, it's served me. And I think also, you know, building win-win relationships where, you know, you get away from, again, the, the politics, the divisiveness, the mean girl thing, like get away from all of the energies because you can choose that too, right? The people you're around. And so you want to be around people that like, you're excited to be together, right? Cause you're, you know, you're all rising together. Right. So that all, I think all of these elements, you know, you're feeling good in the life you're choosing in the shoes you're wearing and the people you're around and the life that, you know, every day that you wake up to, it's all part of it. I love that. I love that. Especially the win, win relationship. What does that look like? Cause for me, when I, when I go and I talk to somebody that I'm, you know, building a relationship with where we might do business together, I always like to ask, what is your goal? Like, you know, what's your vision for your life? How does that conversation look like with you when you're building a win-win relationship? Well, I think you hit, you know, the nail on the head. I think, I think it's really about you're serving each other, right? Because the minute that that balance is thrown off, that relationship more often than not is not going to work. You have to have, you know, and everybody has to be exchanging energy in a way that serves each other. And that's the beauty of, I think, where the world is today. I think we're waking up to, in a lot of ways, that this old school business model of talk at your vendors, you know, beat them down. And like, Mm -hmm. no, like I approach my vendors, my partners, you know, my other stakeholders, whether it's a board member or an investor, or it's a farmer or factory worker the same way, which is how can we win-win together? How do we, you know, create something, co-create something that serves us both? And that Mm. is, if you kind of have that mindset, you're going to get a lot farther and faster as well. I love that. Now you're in business with your husband. What is maybe one piece of advice you would give couples wanting to go into business together? So we have a consulting agency called Beyond Brands that we started together. You know, I think probably that we um, divide and conquer, like we have different, you know, ways that we serve the business. And, and, you know, historically, I'm not as hands-on in the business now. I'm more of like a chairwoman of the board because I'm more focused on Eco Fashion Corp, but I'm part of the, you know, Beyond Brands family and I do lean in as much as I, you know, I can. 
But I think it also comes down to finding boundaries. Like we are as entrepreneurs kind of wired to always be on. And I think, you know, my husband's probably better at this than I am, but like, let's not talk about business right now. Let's like, cause you know, we could be talking business 24 seven to, right. to each other, literally. So I, you know, we go on date nights and we, you know, we take long walks on the weekends and we listen to podcasts together. And, you know, we share a lot of passion for things that, you know, we make sure that we tune into over and above just the business side of, of our life, which is important. And obviously something that we do talk about as well, but it's about finding balance. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. My husband and I are in a couple businesses together as well. So I always like to ask that question. <laughs> you gotta have boundaries, right? Yeah. But the, the fun part is when we get to like travel together for business and like we joke about that, we'll be like, at the end of that, you know, networking event, we get to go home together. Isn't this right? Great? Like we still, we've been together for 13 years and we still like love that, you know? Oh, I love that. Now, <laughs> I have a question for you because you've invested in a lot of companies as well. What are kind of like your you know, investment principles when you're saying, okay, this is a company worth investing in. I get like decks sent to me all the time. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. But I had to create my own philosophy, you know, of like, okay, this is the start, the types of things I want to invest in. And this is how I want the money to come back. What, what does that look like for you? What are your rules, I guess? Well, I guess as a starting point, you know, because of our, my husband and I, our shared passion for, you know, conscious business, organic, natural, you know, anything that would touch kind of our values, like ethically made, fair trade, all of that, that's a starting point. So like, mm -hmm. I would never invest in anything that isn't true to my values. Then as a skill set, if I can add value, and I say this even as an entrepreneur raising money, right? Like I'm always raising money for something, you know, and I want investors that share my core values. I don't want someone to try to like tell me, oh, no, no, you don't need to use recycled paper. It costs a little bit more or you don't need, you know, like, wait, what? You know, like <laughs> you, you need to make sure that, you know, the people you're aligned with not just invest the things you're investing into, but the people investing into you. Otherwise it's like, you know, in marriage, if you have nothing in common, eventually it's, you know, might be really great sex at the beginning, or it might mm -hmm. be like, you know, it might work for some superficial reasons out of the gate, but it's probably not going to last. So I think that the older we get, I always joke with my kids that it's illegal to get married before you're 30, you know, because like you really don't totally always know exactly who you are and what you want. And, and until you are comfortable in your own skin and have a sense of self, you know, you're, you might not choose the right partner for you. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, that sort of mirror hasn't really set in yet to understand sort of who you're going to see back at yourself. Right. And we go through lots of different, even not just per professionally pivoting, but personally think how much you grow, you know, chapter to chapter, you know, Absolutely. we joke about that too, my husband and I. So, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, we want to make sure that we have people around us, partners around us and choices around us that serve us that reflect who we are. Mm, I love that. Now going to that, like you're surrounding yourself with people and you've had to pivot, right? With, okay, this relationship isn't going to work, you know, or whatever. Lots of pivots. Let's talk about the pivots in marketing because you built your first businesses before the internet, before TikTok, right? Before Instagram. <laughs> and I just saw, you know, you did the Barbie trend last week on Instagram, right? Like you are definitely like you adapt to what is happening. Yes. And I think that how well you adapt and embrace new ways of marketing is, you know, it can make or break your business. And obviously you've done it. You've stayed on top of it. How, how do you know that? Like, what do you just put again, the right people around you with marketing? So, you know, Mark, I think being sort of, again, wired like an entrepreneur, marketing is in your blood. I know. Right. Right. You like almost don't have to think about it. You just are it. So like for me, you know, it goes back to like storytelling. Like I just consider myself a storyteller, but I'm also a story doer. I'm not one of these people that just, you know, talks and then like expects everyone else to do everything. You know, it for me, like I'm excited rolling my sleeves up and diving in and 
creating things that haven't existed before that gets me like real that's like you know i'm like a junkie for like that right like coming mm -hmm. up with new ideas being the first to do something you know having my finger on the pulse of like what's next and like kind of thinking through the lens of like always like how do i raise the bar how do i go beyond what already exists so my manufacturing company is called metaware and the word meta means beyond right mm -hmm. and you know now of course meta is everywhere but you know i started metaware in 2012 and my you know husband and i our brand our company is called beyond brands so it's always about going beyond thinking mm -hmm. beyond you know living beyond so, you know, even when I wrote my book, you know, I, my publisher was Simon and Schuster. And, you know, at some point they were like, okay, just come down a little bit, you know, cause I'm like <laughs> always like big idea person. So marketing to me is like, it's the fun part, you know, and it's the part about like, how do I, can, how do I communicate what I say is source to story, right? Mm -hmm. The beginning to the end, the verticality of what I've been doing my whole life. And the why and the what and the how and the when and the where, that's the and. And my brand that, you know, is yes and dot style. You know, we're in just getting it going now, but it, you know, the next year or two, I think you'll see a lot of growth with yes and. But it really is my mantra that yes, you can have everything you want, you know, in the case of fashion, style, quality, fit, color, comfort, hand, price, and organic circular certified low impact all of the good stuff that's the yummy stuff so marketing that story is like my opening chapter of my book is all about yes and so every day that i'm wearing which i'm wearing yes and right now this is 100 percent organic cotton space dyed you know really soft and buttery and like love it and i feel good about it and so I, it's easy for me i could never and i can't market something i don't believe in let's mm -hmm. just say that mm -hmm. so like i was going on qvc all through covid and it wasn't about, you know, for our other brand, Seed to Style and Farm to Home, which Farm to Home just launched this week in Costco nationwide. Oh, Organic comforters. Thank That's you. Amazing. But, you know, going on air for, you know, the last few years, it wasn't about my lack of like desire, passion and ability to market. It was also understanding your audience. Yes. So when you're marketing and the last thing I'll say is meet whoever you're marketing to where they are. And then take their hand and don't ever, you know, try to like talk at people, talk with them. And even like as a leader mentor myself, I always say, you know, it's not about teaching by preaching. It's about teaching by example. You know, mm. walk your talk and talk your walk. That is so good. Oh my gosh, I have chills just thinking about that. I love that. I think that if you're passionate about something and because you have that big vision, that overhead vision of of where you're going, you don't let the small things get in the way of like, oh, there's another trend That's to right. get on top of. Oh my gosh, it's this. It's oh, oh, this is so exciting. How can I fit my my education into this marketing trend that's happening right now? So I think for the the people listening in right now that don't have the amount of passion that you have, what would you say to them? Because, you know, I think a lot of people haven't really caught on to that, you know, because everything's hard to them. And I think it's because they're, they don't have that God sized vision. It's baby steps. I think if you set too big a goal, you're going to set yourself up for failure. Mm -hmm. So just like one step at a time. And I talk about this in my, you know, I have a chapter in my book that's about wellness and whether it's even just simple things like, you know, again, the lifestyle choices that you're making that will help empower you to feel differently, like sleep, exercise, eating well. I mean, there's a reason that when women get pregnant, all of a sudden, you know, they're like, oh, got to stop, you know, drinking as much coffee, eating as much crap, you know, and fast food and stopping smoking and stopping this and stopping that because you're creating life. Well, why should we feel any differently? <laughs> and, you know, and we put our babies down to sleep and we make sure that they're, you know, bathed and they're warm and that they're taken care of and they're nurtured. Mm -hmm. Why do we then not do the same thing for ourselves? Right. And I think that's part of, you know, being able to find tune back into who we are is feeling back in your own skin that you're, that you're taking care of yourself. And, and to me, you know, like people always say like, what do you do for, you know, self care, you know, and like, I start every single day 
just meditating. You know, I wake up very early. My body wants to like get up with nature, whether I like it or not. And no matter what time I go to bed, I'm the same way. <laughs> so it's like, up, oh, sun's up. And so am I, or not even. So, you know, I steam, you know, and I, I, I walk and I, you know, and I lie in bed sometimes and I just kind of chill before I dive into my nonstop crazy day. I make sure I take that time to just kind of have some space. Like a lot of people ask me, like, cause I travel quite a bit, you know, God, don't you ever get sick of traveling? I'm like, I actually love being on airplanes and in hotel rooms by myself. Cause it's like very <laughs> almost nurturing, you know, like where I can just focus and sort of ground myself and, you know, not feel so pulled and, you know, pushed and pulled. I mean, it's funny cause the pandemic in some ways has been our greatest gift. Cause you know, it, it, as much as there was, and I don't make light of the suffering, I think the fact that it taught people to sort of reset their priorities and focus on things like wellness and health. Because if you don't have that, you have nothing, right? Like Absolutely. it doesn't matter how much, how big your apartment is or how much money you make or what, you know, all the uh, parties you're going to go to, like none of that matters, right? Like if you aren't healthy. So I think that, you know, again, whether you're talking about confidence or you're talking about, you know, success or you're talking about anything, I think it does start with taking care of ourselves. Mm, I love that. Well, I think that's a great note to end on is just that reminder that every person listening in right now is worthy of time for themselves in whatever way that looks like for them. And I know there's going to be people, I'm not a morning person. I used to not be a morning person either when I was really in like the grind stage of, I was 23 and I was just like total, just grinding, you know, and I would work through the night because, you know, Australia was on a different time zone than me. And, you know, like all those things. And then when I started to realize like, at what point am I willing to like be successful at the, you know, expense of my health? And I was like in 28 and I was already experiencing adrenal fatigue and all these things. And I had to really reevaluate. And I, I really want to stress this point because, you know, figure it out before you hit that type of, that type of burnout, you know, like really like make yourself a priority. And now I'm the same as you. I mean, it is, I always wake up when it's dark and I'm like, Oh, do I want to sleep a little bit longer? No, nope, my body's ready to go. Let's go. And I read a book and I really like that slow time before anybody else is up in the house. It's so powerful. It's so powerful. And it's free. That's the beauty. Like oh, there's no, ex there's no excuse. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the simplest things, you know, meditation, doing, you know, yoga asanas just to kind of ground yourself, you know, whatever tools you have in your toolkit, they don't cost money. You just have to have the discipline. You have to mm -hmm. have the mindset and the desire, right? Cause nobody's going to like, you always hear like, you can't change somebody. You can't make them something they're not. They have to want that. Absolutely. We all have the ability to, to make the kinds of choices that, you know, will serve us and that will, you know, ground us. And one of the things I'll just end, you know, saying is, you know, I've been going to India for 25 years. You know, I, I've been building supply chains there and, you know, and the first time I ever went, went and I saw like a huge slum right out of the airport, it was like two in the morning coming out of Mumbai. And, you know, there were just like people everywhere, like including kids lying on the streets. And, and I like started crying and my factory partner who picked me up at the airport said, you know, why are you so upset? And I said, this is so devastating to see like, uh, like so much poverty. And he said, why are you imposing your own values in, in our country? Karma is such, is such a fundamental belief system that there's a sense of whether you're walking, taking a bike, a train or a car or a jet plane, we're all going to the same destination. So enjoy the ride. So just mm. because you feel sad, that doesn't mean they do. In fact, I would venture to say there's a lot more very rich, sad people in your country than there are poor, sad people in my country. It was oh, really wow. like eye opening. And it kind of put things into perspective because, you know, you hear money doesn't buy happiness, but you know, the reality is it doesn't. You know, mm -hmm. it buys comfort, it buys security, but it doesn't buy happiness, you know, and there's a fine line, but there's a big enough gap there that if you, you know, you need to focus on what really matters. Going back to what I said about the pandemic, family, 
right? And our health and, you know, making sure that, and, that, and I think this whole great resignation that happened during the pandemic was not about people like leaving the job force. It was about people seeking purpose in their lives. Absolutely. Wow. Well, this conversation was so eye-opening. I got chills so many times. So I really appreciate you, Marcy, and just the work that you've been doing. You know, you've been blazing trails for us. And I think, you know, just going back to IIN, I don't know if I would even be as successful as I am today if I wouldn't have gone through that. I became a health coach, you know, and like just all the pivots that came after that. But it was really like going through that program and it opened my eyes to just new ways of thinking and new ways of being in the world. And so, wow, that's just, I literally have chills that so you created that. And there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of people's lives have been changed because of that. So it's absolutely Thank amazing. You. I'm honored to know you and I'm excited to get out your message and all of your clothing to the world. So Thank we're going to make sure to link up all of your websites in the show notes. I'm going to go buy what you have on right now. I need awesome. that outfit. It's so cute. <laughs> and I'll make sure to tag you and everything on social media. So. Thank you so much for having me. And then just a fun fact, we're working on a collaboration with IIN, Ooh. an apparel collab. So I, it's like bringing like all these different pieces together, which is super exciting. So Oh my gosh. Yay. I'm excited. I'm going to go to Amazing. Costco too. I got to get any comforter now. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. No, it's, and that's, that's it. No compromise, you know, sleep better, live better, dream better, dream big and be the change, eat the change, live the change and wear the change. We all want to see. Mm, so good. Thank you everybody yeah. for listening in and I hope you enjoyed it so much. Go pick up Marcy's book. Again, it's going to be in the show notes. Share this message out on all the social media channels that you're on and tag me and Marcy if you love this episode.